The following program is the work of the broadcast students at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. BCIT Magazine features news stories from around the Lower Mainland which were produced over the last week. Responsibility for the content of the show rests completely with the students and their instructors. Today on BCIT Magazine, anti-maskers go to the beach. Airsoft guns are under fire. And geese are taking over the HUD. Hello, welcome to BCIT Magazine. I'm Tiger Yan. And I'm Sadie Chung. Let's take a look at this week's news. If you're looking to buy a new home, be prepared to dig deep. Many houses have been flying off the market at record prices during the pandemic. Reporter Mohammed Hussein investigates whether this trend will end anytime soon. As home prices continue to skyrocket, the search for affordable housing has become quite difficult for many. So I just had my son move out of town to Revelstoke, yeah. where he just can't afford to live here. According to a recent report by Demographia, Vancouver was ranked the second least affordable city in the world behind Hong Kong. Even, even people with money would have a hard time finding a place within a reasonable amount of time. Even cities such as New York and London, which have 12 times Vancouver's population, were ranked significantly more affordable. Sean Brown, a realtor with over a decade of experience in the market, explains that adjustments to remote learning played a huge part in the surge of demand throughout the Lower Mainland. So basically more space, more rooms, and, and, and in many cases, in order, to for, in order to afford that, further out. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're seeing so many of the basically surrounding little cities or smaller towns or whatever um, around big cities seeing huge um, increases in run-ups and prices. However, there are some who think the hefty price tag is reasonable. If you want to live in the close to downtown core, you're going to be paying a lot of money, be it Paris or Sydney or San Francisco or wherever it might be. I think it's, it's, uh, it's one of the best places to live and um, I think it's temporary. I don't know if the market will always be this high. As for what the projections are for the rest of the year, Brown noted that the combination of COVID-19 vaccines and low interest rates will keep housing demand high, but there is one aspect that could potentially equalize the market. The only thing that could make the, mar the market a little bit less hot is if, is if there's a, a more of an influx of supply that comes on to almost balance out that demand much more so than it is at this time. Brown added that being very proactive is a massive key to being successful in today's housing market. For BCIT Magazine, I'm Mohammed Hussein. Anti-mask protesters continue to hold rallies in public areas in opposition to COVID-19 health orders. Last weekend, the gathering was at Sunset Beach. There were several posters and signs against wearing masks or getting vaccinated. The protest was organized by a group called We're All Essential. A Vancouver lawyer and BPD media officer explained rights around protesting during a pandemic. The government could certainly put in health orders that limit the right to protest. The government has been very reluctant to do that, uh, even though the gatherings and events orders arguably cover that. Um, they haven't been interpreted or enforced as applying to protests. The reason for that is that the right to protest is a protected right in Canada. It's uh, your freedom of, of association, your freedom of uh, peaceful assembly, your freedom of uh, expression are all included in the right to protest. We respect their right to peacefully assemble, to peacefully protest and to express their views. And we expect them to do so safely. And if they don't, we will do what we can to remind them. Um, and encourage them to be safe and to obey the public health orders. We are now joined by reporter Angela Bauer. Angela, what was the experience like at the protest? How did they respond to the media? The protesters were not friendly towards people who were wearing a mask. In fact, one of the court indicators came up to me and told me that if I wanted to stay at the protest, I had to remove my mask. And Angela, were any arrests made at this protest? 
There were no arrests made uh, during that protest. However, the Vancouver Police Department did arrive around 9 p.m. to clear the protesters from the public beach area. Back to you. Thank you, Angela. Burnaby residents are de dealing with the Canada goose overpopulation problem. The geese have been polluting local sports fields and parks. As reporter David Natalini explains, locals are all too familiar with this foul problem. Gooses, geeses. Laying eggs is the last thing that Burnaby officials want Canadian geese to do this Easter. <laughs> The Canada Geese Management Plan is the board's response to the growing number of geese around cities like Burnaby and Vancouver. Staff at BC's Wildlife Rescue Association say that populations will be controlled through egg addling. The government actually um, allows the permitting to addle the eggs, which is um, destroying the eggs and allowing the geese to think that they still have a nest there so that they don't actually re-nest. According to the Vancouver Park Board, Canadian geese don't just eat newly seeded grass, they also dig up holes around sprinkler heads and also defecate on public property. Whoa, watch out! Over in Kensington, girls soccer coach Natalie DeVita says that while geese avoid the fields during practices, the damage they leave behind is an obvious danger to her team. Yeah, so we do notice quite a bit of geese poop on the field. It is difficult to clean and it poses a risk if any of my girls were to fall or cut themselves and get feces on their cuts and things like that. Officials want to remind residents that feeding geese at parks is banned. But here, at Burnaby Lake, where food is given to birds by the handful, some people have yet to get the message. Yeah, I don't think we should feed them, definitely. It's a bit, it's a bit unnerving here because people feed birds here all the time and I, I agree we shouldn't be feeding them. As residents continue to enjoy Burnaby's growing and diverse wildlife, officials are sure to keep a bird's eye view on the community. David Natalini in Burnaby for BCIT Magazine. Surrey RCMP say they've dismantled a drug lab capable of producing enough fentanyl to kill more than the population twice in BC. While executing a search warrant at a commercial warehouse in April, the Mounties seized drugs manufacturing equipment and enough chemicals to potentially produce 26 kilograms of fentanyl. Coming up after the break, demand for dogs during the pandemic. And an affordable place to shop. One. You're listening to BCIT's The Crow. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night. And these are your stories for 11 a.m. I'm Hugh Perkich, and you're listening to BCIT's The Crow. Tuning in to the Andy Shire Show here on AM 1680 The Crow. BC officials just released a new COVID-19 update. The Canucks playoff hopes continue to dwindle as they lost to the Toronto Maple Leafs 4-1 yesterday. You're listening to BCIT's The Crow. Welcome back to BCIT Magazine. Airsoft players are upset with gun legislation that targets their sport. If Bill C-21 passes, it could be outlawed overnight. Reporter Kevin Yee has more. These guns may look real, but they are actually battery operated and far from lethal. Nonetheless, Bill C-21 may put them on the prohibited list, spelling an end for the sport of airsoft in Canada. So effectively, it marks the end of the sport. I would only be able to keep these things under my bed. Airsoft has grown in popularity over the last several years as an activity that emphasizes teamwork, sportsmanship, and fair play. Uh, there's people that I've met over the years, over the last eight years, that I would have never crossed paths with. And it's just one of those things that you get out there, you have a good time with your friends, you sit and you chat and you, you, just, you just get outside and get some exercise. There are two parts of Bill C-21 that target the sport in the name of public safety. 
The guns won't be illegal to own, but they can't be bought, sold, or even taken outside of your house. Most of the guns in Airsoft will be affected by the bill because they closely resemble the real deal. Many players understand the concerns raised by the bill, but insist that safety is a top priority. And I guess if I were to bring one of these out in public, I would, I would expect and I would hope that the response would be as if it were a real gun, right? That's the level of safety that we treat these devices with. Across the country, the community has organized to contact MPs and sign petitions. The people involved in the campaign range from casual players to specialized retail stores. The owner and, and the people that work here are all great friends of all of ours. And when this bill came out, to be honest with you, this is one of the places and people, I, these people were some of the people I thought of first. Um, this is his livelihood. According to Airsoft in Canada, retailers are not the only type of business that will be hurt by the bill. The movie industry uses Airsoft guns and tourism also benefits from Airsoft events. The bill still working its way through Parliament. The future of businesses like Trigger is still uncertain, but many in the community are optimistic that changes will be made. I'm Kevin Yee for BCIT Magazine in Richmond. Vancouver's Mayor Kennedy Stewart says he understands that some drug users aren't happy with the city's proposed model for decriminalization. Kennedy is pushing for an exemption from charges on criminal possession of small amounts of drugs. Recently, 18 teams competed in a brand battle for good. It's Canada's first zero-waste marketing challenge. Reporter Joshua Rice spoke with one of the members from the winning team. They came up with an eco-friendly rating system for restaurants. Today I'm joined by Dan Moret from Team Talent Pool after their impressive victory in the brand battle. So Dan, what was the experience like? Broken into these small groups and you're actually, well, should be, you're <laughs> applying everything that you're learning into your own concept and ideation um, to, to help um, come up with a concept that's gonna help push Vancouver towards zero waste. That sounds fantastic. So what was your winning idea and how did you come up with it? So there's 27,000 restaurants in New York and every single one of them uh, has a letter grade rating in front of it. It's either, either an A, B or a C. Um, a is good, you're, you're all set. B is they've had a couple of infractions. C, I would really stay clear of. Um, and anything less than a, uh, less than an A actually gets fined as well by the city. So it's, it's something that's mandatory. Um, but it just kind of, that, that idea just kind of circulated and uh, it made me think, what if, what if we could do something similar in Vancouver? And could we take, um, could we take these restaurants, uh, the restaurants in Vancouver and give them essentially an, an environmental sustainability rating that they could hopefully get, you know, get, get the best score possible and put uh, proudly, proudly display that on the front of their restaurant. Okay, and what will this grade system be based upon? It would look at how they, um, um, how they, the efforts that they do, uh, that they have to reduce waste, um, to eliminate single-use packaging, um, if they're um, sourcing more local ingredients as opposed to ingredients that have to be flown in from wherever, just, you know, all those different efforts to, um, would combine to give them a score. And what are some of the first steps that your team is going to take to implement your idea? And we would want to deliver to all the restaurants a toolkit that helps them, that helps show the different organizations and support that already exists that is being underutilized to help reduce waste or, or packaging. Well, that's all the time we had today. Thanks for coming on, Dan. We're excited to see your idea come to life. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, just thanks for, thanks for your interest in following, following the event and what came out of it. The puppy and pet adoption surge throughout the pandemic has been very real and veterinarians on the North Shore are starting to feel the effects of the pet craze. Our reporter Michael Williams has more. North Shore vets have been busy the last year. Some vets are claiming they are up 100% in business since the start of the pandemic. With these uncertain times, many people have chosen to either adopt or purchase a furry companion leaving most vets on the North Shore at full capacity. Husband, because we had to at one point stop taking new clients just to be able to accommodate our existing clients and be able to service them. Um, we're still taking in new patients, but definitely I know some colleagues who are um, at their capacity in being able to take in new clients and patients. Um, and they've had to kind of turn them away um, because they just didn't have the staff or the resources to be able to handle all the increased in um, number of pets being seen. 
Pet owners in the near future can expect longer wait times if you're wanting someone to see your pet. Moving forward, veterinarians ask the public to keep offering their patience and kindness. Michael Williams, BCIT Magazine. Our reporter Michael Williams joins us now live. Michael, is there anything else contributing to the influx of pets and long wait times clinics on the North Shore are facing? Most of these clinics are, are very understaffed and with the shortage of veterinarians in BC, the pandemic really just sped up the demand for the profession. Is there anything else that is being done to improve this situation? The BC SPCA has reached out to the provincial government and asked for additional funding for 20 more spots at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and they've put a petition on their website. To sign that petition, you can visit the bcspca.ca. Back to you. Thanks, Michael. The debate surrounding graffiti is a hot button issue across the Lower Mainland. Is it a valid form of artful expression or simply vandalism? Reporter Jeremy Shepard takes a look. In the Lower Mainland, graffiti is seen covering a wide array of surfaces, from concrete walls to garbage cans. For many of us, it's a subculture we've never truly understood. It's just like super interesting that there's this whole like underground culture that's like sort of out of the eye of the mainstream, but you still see it every day, you know? From low effort scribbles to elaborate murals, street art encompasses a range of artistic endeavors. But there are a lot of spots in Vancouver where, you know, you can take five, ten hours, however long you need, and really put a lot of time into it. Some businesses commission artists for their work, while others pay to have graffiti covered up. Uh, when the customer, you know, come, you know, come by this building, we say some graffiti, maybe they have bad influence for the business, maybe. For many, graffiti artists' motives remain unclear. Some graffitis are cool. Yeah. Some are, some are very talented people who do it, but around this neighborhood, around, around, around the building that I work in, I don't see any talented graffitis. It's all like pretty much like just to show some kind of a rage towards the wall and like people around here. Often, the belief is that these artists' talents can be better utilized in more worthy avenues. These guys are, they're skilled. They're, they're, you know, it's, 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 it's a gift, right? I mean, if you're able to draw, it's a gift. I can do it. Art is a subjective medium, and to better understand people's motives, we must speak to them and learn from their perspective. Jeremy Shepard, BCIT Magazine. Andy Warhol canvas owned by rocker Alice Cooper is going up for auction in October. The red acrylic and silk screen on canvas is called Little Electric Chair. It was part of Warhol's Death and Disaster series from the mid-1960s. Coming up, a twist on art galleries. and how makeup artists continue to beautify. Going live in three, two, one. BCIT Television and Video Production. You've got potential. And cut. That's a wrap, folks. BCIT, your future starts here. Challenges during the pandemic. While most therapy sessions are offered online, you might want to try a COVID-friendly in-person version. It encourages you to take a stroll outside. My co-anchor Sadie Chong went for a walk. 
Many of us are walking outdoors as a way to get out of the house during the pandemic, but it's also a way for therapists to help their clients with walk and talk therapy. I take people out into Stanley Park, uh, out into the North Shore, um, and it just, it, it's a way for them to release uh, everything that they're thinking about. They can just stop and stare and immerse themselves in the environment around them. Though the concept of movement and therapy is not a new practice, it sparked interest as a COVID safe alternative to therapy. Most people I know feel better when they go outside, uh, even if they don't want to at first. Um, but then also it helps the therapist. Like it's gonna help. It's gonna be a positive for both, a win-win. Although the forecast in Vancouver is often rainy, walk and talk therapy is a rain or shine activity. I have a session at seven coming up right now. Oh, yeah. Jurek says he uses nature as a mirror to help his clients understand the change that's going on in their lives. Nature's a great teacher because nature's never hanging on to anything permanently. It's always letting go of things that are done, that have kind of done their time. And so it's a kind of a metaphorical teacher walking out of nature is that way for people. And it basically reassures you, you can let it go. And nature's clearing space for people to come back in a more evolved way in the world. Sadie Chung in Vancouver for BCIT Magazine. Makeup artists are getting creative and are brushing off the challenges of the pandemic. Reporter JC Chambers shows us how. On the east side of Vancouver, there's a window art gallery called Outsiders and Others, and it's designed to be a COVID-friendly art community. So because COVID started and we were all shut down, I knew that I needed to see, as an artist, new culture on a regular basis. And it, I was given the opportunity to get this small space, so I decided to open a window gallery uh, for COVID. Visitors can stop by anytime, whether it's day or night, to scan the QR code and get all information needed. Um, you, there's a link there that takes you to the current exhibition. You can, will be able to see every piece of artwork. You'll be able to read everything about the artwork, about the exhibition and the artists, and then you can purchase the artwork right through the site that way. The gallery focuses on bringing non-traditional, marginalized and self-taught artists to forefront. Artists such Lucy, who faces a chronic disease. So I have uh, seizures, which um, obviously interrupts life, you know, on the generals. I was, you know, trying to describe what was happening and, you know, and I was, I was not, not really making sense. Um, but I was talking about uh, dazzling and, you know, circles and, and all this kind of stuff. And so afterwards I gave that some thought and I thought, you know, what would it be like to bring some of these spots or bring some of these splashes of color or bring some of the contrast into the artwork? Opening an art gallery during COVID is almost impossible, yet this gallery has succeeded and it challenges the very notion of what an art gallery should be. Leila Kader for BCIT Magazine in Vancouver. Apologies, that was the wrong story. BC has seen its second case of a rare blood clotting syndrome after receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine. A man in his 40s had the serious reaction, but is being treated and expected to recover. Dr. Bonnie Henry says there are fewer instances of this rare condition with the second dose. Greyhound Canada is permanently cutting all its routes across the country. Senior Vice President Stuart Kendrick says the announcement means the end of all Greyhound operation in Canada after 92 years of service. A Vancouver artist wants to add some beauty to this pandemic by opening a new gallery with a unique window on the world. Reporter Leila Kadir shows us around. On the east side of Vancouver, there's a window art gallery called Outsiders and Others, and it's designed to be a COVID-friendly art community. So because COVID started, and we were all shut down, I knew that I needed to see, as an artist, new culture on a regular basis. And it, I was given the opportunity to get this small space, so I decided to open a window gallery uh, for COVID. 
Visitors can stop by anytime, whether it's day or night, to scan the QR code and get all information needed. Um, you, there's a link there that takes you to the current exhibition. You can, will be able to see every piece of artwork. You'll be able to read everything about the artwork, about the exhibition and the artists, and then you can purchase the artwork right through the site that way. The gallery focuses on bringing non-traditional, marginalized and self-taught artists to forefront. Artists such as Lucy, who faces a chronic disease. So I have uh, seizures, which um, obviously interrupts life, you know, on the generals. I was, you know, trying to describe what was happening and, you know, and I was, I was not, not really making sense. Um, but I was talking about uh, dazzling and, you know, circles and, and all this kind of stuff. And so afterwards I gave that some thought and I thought, you know, what would it be like to bring some of these spots or bring some of these splashes of color or bring some of the contrast into the artwork? Opening an art gallery during COVID is almost impossible, yet this gallery has succeeded and it challenges the very notion of what an art gallery should be. Leila Kader for BCIT Magazine in Vancouver. In weather, over the next few days, we can expect a lot of sunshine with a low of 9 degrees and a high of 22 degrees away from the water. Looking towards next week, we will be seeing a mix of rain and sun. Keep your fingers crossed for the good weather for the upcoming May long weekend. If you have any questions regarding the show, you can contact us at bcit-broadcast.com or bcitnews.com. Thanks for watching BCIT Magazine. I'm Tiger Ann. And I'm Sadie Chung. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.